in the last video, we got a feel for the idea that sigma p is kind of an independent variable scale of electron donating or withdrawing power. So one thing we can think about doing in studying new organic reactions is taking all those tabulated, very well known, very well studied sigma p values and trying to correlate them with the logarithm of a ratio of rate constants for a new reaction that we have under study. So maybe I'm thinking about varying a substituent in a new chemical reaction and looking at the logarithm of the ratio of the rate constant when that substituent is R versus our standard rate constant when the substituent is H and seeing how that correlates with sigma P. Now, the correlation will not be perfect unless the reaction is exactly the ionization of a parasubstituted benzoic acid, in which case we've done nothing new, right? So here we should expect a correlation, not an exact relationship to emerge when we try to study the impact of sigma p on the rate of our new reaction. However, this correlation is highly useful and gives us great mechanistic insight, as we'll see. And this correlation, this relationship between sigma p or more generally any sigma parameter as the independent variable and this logarithm of a ratio of rate constants, which is most common, or equilibrium constants, which we can also do, as the dependent variables, the correlation between those two is exactly what's known as a linear free energy relation, or LFER, L-F-E-R. Linear because we're thinking of this correlation as linear. There is some constant of proportionality that's going to multiply our independent variable, sigma p. That constant has special meaning, and we'll come to that in a second. That times some constant of proportionality is equal to the logarithm of this ratio. So it's linear in that sense. It's called a free energy relation because the logarithm of this ratio is essentially a free energy. We touched on this earlier. It relates back to the law of mass action and how delta G and activation energy are related to equilibrium constants and rate constants, respectively, which actually ties things back to your introductory chemistry courses on some level. I won't go into detail on that, but you should think through why this is called a free energy relation. And that's, that's pretty much it. And as I mentioned, this gives us great mechanistic insight. So let's start exploring why that is and, and how this works. So the output of a Hammett study is going to be a graph where on the x-axis we have our sigma parameter. We're just going to use sigma p to keep things simple with electron donating groups on the left-hand side with negative values less than zero, right? Electron donating substituents are going to appear on the left and electron withdrawing substituents are going to appear on the right as our x-axis. For the y-axis, we're going to measure the rate constant of our reaction of interest using a variety of different substituents R and we're going to measure the logarithm of the ratio of the rate constant when the substituent is R divided by the rate constant when the substituent is H for many, many different substituents. And those are going to be our Y values. A perfect correlation between our reaction under study and the ionization of parasubstituted benzoic acids would result in a line with a slope of 1. And this is essentially never observed in practice unless the reaction under study is very, very close to that ionization of parasubstituted benzoic acids. So the output we should expect from a Hammett study is a series of points on this graph for several different substituents. Each point represents a different substituent, and there's going to be some line of best fit that includes all of these points, and that line will pass through zero since, of course, at, at this point, the R substituent is H, and by definition, the logarithm of that ratio is going to be equal to zero. So the line will pass through the origin, but the slope in general will not be one. Here, for example, the slope is less than one in this hypothetical example. The slope may be positive or negative. So for example, we may see a line of best fit that slopes downward like this, and that gives us useful mechanistic information. Here, the slope is, is negative. And we'll see what that mechanistic information is here in a second. And so these linear correlations are going to be what pops out of a Hammett study. Now to understand what these lines of best fit are telling us, let's look at two examples of reactions that we might study in a, a Hammett study to get an LFER out. So here we have a reduction reaction of an imine. Sodium borohydride is essentially a nucleophilic reagent delivering hydride to the imine carbon 
which is acting as electrophile. Now, let's say hypothetically we didn't know that. Let's say we suspected, right, based on the theory of organic chemistry that, hey, I think the imine carbon is acting as an electrophile and I suspect that the sodium borohydride is acting as a nucleophile. What we can infer from that mechanistic picture is that this carbon is accepting electron density in the key mechanistic step of this reaction. That's actually analogous to what's happening in the deprotonation of a parasubstituted benzoic acid, right? Imagine this was a carboxylate carbon or a carboxylic acid carbon. That carbon is accepting electron density when the carboxyl group is deprotonated. A similar thing electronically is happening here. And so we should expect, and in fact we observe, a linear and positive correlation between the sigma p value for the substituent r and the logarithm of the rate constant for this reaction. That positive slope tells us that the imine substrate is accepting electron density in the rate determining step of the reaction mechanism. And of course, we can think about reasoning this out backwards. Say I had no idea how sodium borohydride acts. Well, if I ran this study, made these measurements, and got a positive correlation, I could conclude that the imine substrate is accepting electron density in the rate determining step, just based on what I know already about the nature of sigma p. The slope here is greater than 1. That's going to give us useful information that we'll return to on the next slide, although it may well be less than one. But it's gonna be positive because our substrate containing that variable substituent is acting as an electrophile in the key mechanistic step. In the second case, the situation is different. Now we have a reaction where, again, based on the theory of organic chemistry, we would expect that in the protonation step anyway, this carbon is acting as a nucleophile, really a Bronsted base, right? It's being protonated by the HCl. If that step is rate determining, which is not always well known, right? Say I had no idea what the rate determining step was. Is it donation of electron density by the alkene electrons or is it the accepting of electron density of the carbocation that results by chloride? Maybe I don't know, but let's say hypothetically that protonation is the rate determining step. And this kind of makes sense given that we're making a carbocation in that step, right? In that case, I would observe now not a positive correlation on the Hammett plot, but a negative correlation. So the line still passes through zero, but now the correlation is negative. Why is the correlation negative? Well, intuitively, the rate of reaction is decreasing as the electron withdrawing strength of this substituent is increasing. Intuitively, what does that mean? That means that the substrate containing the variable substituent is donating electron density, acting as a nucleophile, Lewis base or Bronsted base, in the rate determining step. And again, we, we kind of expect this based on the mechanism, although I love this example because it's a two-step mechanism in which in the first step the substrate donates electrons, but in the second step that substrate accepts electrons. What a Hammett study allows us to do in this case is distinguish between those two steps and identify the one that is rate determining, which if we obtained this result, allows us to conclude that protonation of the alkene is rate determining. So we've just seen how the sign of the slope gives us insight into the nature of the substrate in the rate determining step, whether it's acting as an electrophile or a nucleophile. But the magnitude of the slope also gives us information, and this is called the reaction constant rho, since it's characteristic of the reaction itself, right? There is a reaction constant, for example, for the hydrochlorination of that specific styrene that we looked at on the last slide, or the reduction of that specific imine. The magnitude of the slope captures the sensitivity of that reaction to changes in the electronic donating or withdrawing nature of the substituent. And generally speaking, larger rho indicates that the reaction is more sensitive to changes in the donating or withdrawing power of the substituent. So for example, let's go back to our reduction of this imine substrate. We saw there that this reaction tends to get faster as sigma p for the substituent increases as the substituent gets more electron 
withdrawing. We saw previously that the rate of this reaction is going to increase as the electron withdrawing power of the substituent goes up, something like this, positive correlation on the Hammett plot. Let's call this reaction one, and let's call the slope of this line rho one. It's the reaction constant for reaction one. But now let's change up the imine substrate and ask what happens. What if I replace the methyl group with a tosyl group? We can say a lot of things about the difference between methyl and tosyl, right? For example, we should expect this carbon to be more electrophilic than the one in the methyl imine because tosyl is an electron withdrawing group. But generally speaking, in the absence of experimental information, we don't know how sensitive the second reaction will be to changes in the electronics of the substrate due to varying R. All we can say is let's go measure it, right? And say we, we do measure it, and let me actually use a different color for this. Say we do measure it and we get the correlation that I'm drawing here in green. This has some reaction constant, which is the slope of this line. Let's call that row two. And it's very clear from the graph that row two is less than row one. The conclusion we can draw from this is that reaction two is less sensitive to changes in the electronics of the substrate than reaction one is. And that may have something to do with the fact that this imine is already pretty electrophilic due to the electron withdrawing power of the tosyl group. Generally speaking, we can rationalize the outcome either way. The important point is that these experimental measurements of the rate constant as a function of the substituent and relating that back to a sigma parameter allows us to draw those conclusions from experimental data.